Hi, this is Dan from Akatika, and today we're going to start a series of videos about building the PR-102. We're going to concentrate on the things that you might not know if you're a new builder, and even if you're an experienced builder, there might be a few tips that could help you. So right here we've got a brand new PR-102 stereo preamplifier kit, and if you look inside the box, you'll see that there are basically two things. There's a box of parts and then there's also some foam and in the foam we have very carefully packed the chassis. Turns out that most of what we're going to do at first is just going to deal with the box of parts. So let's just pull the box of parts out and then we'll set the overall packing aside. So we'll open up the parts box and to do that I'm just going to open the knife to the first stop so that we have no chance of somehow running the knife right through some components inside. We'll take all the parts from the power supply envelope and we will carefully empty them into the soup bowl. Nice and slowly so nothing bounces in and out of the soup bowl. Now we'll have to go back into the parts and we'll find the power supply PC board. Let's do that. If I recall correctly, all the PC boards are, of course, way at the bottom. There we go. And we'll look through and pull out the power supply PC board. There's the power supply PC board. We'll start building it now. Let's take a minute to review some of the tools that you'll be using. Of course, you'll need some kind of small diagonal cutters. I have Hacko over here, and this is from Harbor Freight, the Pittsburgh line of diagonal cutters. You'll also need a soldering iron. That's my favorite. These soldering irons perform well. They are inexpensive. About 20 bucks you can get them at Parts Express. And of course we're going to need some solder. This is 0.031 inch diameter solder. I like Kester solder. This is a 6337, a eutectic solder. That's the best stuff to use. So let's get started. First thing we've got to do is power up the soldering iron, get that started. And the other thing we want to do is the sponge. The sponge should be wet. That was easy. The sponge is now wet. It gives us a way to clean the gross muck off of the tip. There's a better way actually to do a lot of the cleaning that you need to do. And this is a wire cleaner. The wire cheaner is made by Hakko, H-A-K-K-O. The advantage is that when you clean the solder tip and the wire cleaner, it does not change the tip of the soldering iron's temperature nearly as much as it does to run it across a wet sponge. So before we get started, we'll take a look and see. Yeah, it doesn't look great to me. So what we're going to do is something called tinning the tip. And when we tin the tip, what we want to do is to have some solder everywhere on the tip in a thin film. And it looks like we'll have to wait a little bit for the iron to heat up. We tin the soldering iron by taking a little solder and kind of working it on to the soldering iron. And if it's really working well, what you'll see is a thin film of solder and kind of an even glistening silver color. We really don't have that quite yet. The tip's not bad, the body's a little, eh, maybe we can do better. So what we can do is wipe the tip off on the sponge and let's try again. Now, if you notice, it doesn't melt at first because we've That's getting there. So what we'll do this time 
is instead we'll use the Hacko wire cleaner. Let me do this a few times. Try again. Hopefully we can get this tip to behave well. The advantage of having a well-tinned tip with a little bit of solder on it is that solder then bridges nicely the gap from the soldering iron to the part that you're trying to transfer heat to. Okay, let's give it one more shot. That seems to be cleaning up pretty well, at least at the tip, and that's where we're really caring about. All right, that looks good, and I think that's ready to go. If you go to the website, you can find the link where you can print out the assembly manual, all 80 pages of it. You may say that's a lot of pages, but I say it answers a lot of the questions. Pretty much everything you ever need to know about building the kit is right here in this manual. And if it isn't, well, you can always send me email or you can watch the rest of this video. Let's get started. We advance in the manual to page 10 where it begins the directions for building the power supply PCB. Basically, what we're going to do is just follow down the chart, look for all the various parts, and install them. We'll get you started here with all the conventional stuff, then we'll cut away and finish it up. But we'll come back in to visit with you when we're doing some things that you might think aren't strictly obvious. We begin by installing a bunch of the 1N4004 diodes. Typically, you'll find them all taped together on one piece of tape. It may vary a little bit with your kit. And what we'll do is look for all the designations, D3, D4, D5, etc. And we will match those against the designations on the silk screen here. So there's the PC board. And if you notice in white letters, there's D4, for example. And all the other diodes and capacitors and various components have positions as marked. There's the silkscreen marking D4. There's D4, and I've bent it to essentially the width of the holes for D4. The only other thing to notice here is that one side of the diode, the cathode, is marked with a white band. And you want to make sure that the white band coincides with the white band on the PC board. Once you're sure about that, insert the diode from the silkscreen side. And I've got to fight with it a little bit because I bent it a little bit too uh, short, but there it is. We'll turn the board over and we'll solder it on the solder side. Often what I'll do is take the leads and bend them a bit, but I'm careful to bend them in a direction where if the lead went a little further in that area or in that direction, I would not cause a short circuit. The bend in the leads tends to keep the body of the diode close to the PC board, which makes it look good. Now I'll set it down so I can solder it. Place the solder between the lead and the tip of the iron. We'll do that again. Place the solder between the lead and the tip of the iron. Give it a second to heat up. And there we go. And each of those soldered joints took about a second. And they look smooth and they look shiny. And there's not a tremendous glob of solder. It's just very neat, nice looking. I'll let you take a look at my solder joint even a little closer.
once you've soldered the leads in place, you'll want to clip the leads. And you want to clip the lead just above the little mound of solder, leaving a little bit of a tail above it. You don't really want to clip the mound itself. And that's the result. Just continue that for all the rest of the components on the board. But like I say, we'll come back and we'll revisit this board a bit for some things that are a little bit out of the ordinary. And the last thing we'll do here is now that D4 has been installed, we want to track that. And we'll just put a check mark there. Once we have a complete set of check marks, we're done this particular section. And we'll move on to the next section about installing the non polarized capacitors. Let's do this first. Just looking ahead a bit, there are two types of diodes. There are 1N4004s, and, and then with a slightly larger body, there are four of these 2A04s. So make sure you don't confuse these diodes with these diodes. Just to make it clear, the small body is the 1N4004 and the larger body diode, of which there are only four, you'll see that difference here. Sometimes things can go a bit faster and neater if you use a lead bender. And in the directions, it will show you what width it is that you'd like to have the leads bent to make everything fit very well. In the case of these diodes, it's 0.45 inches. So we go halfway between the 0.4 and the 0.5, and we get 0.45 inches. We bend it like that. The diode is now at the perfect spacing. And if we take that diode, and we look for, and my apologies to you guys, we're trying to see what I'm doing, but I'll take D9 at random. But I'll also be very careful with D9, and I'll show it to you in a second that, if you'll notice, it just dropped in very easily. Let's take a look. The white band is by the white line inside the silk screen. We'll flip it over. We'll bend the leads a bit in a way that would not provoke a short circuit, as we've done there. And then we'll solder this in place. Now, actually, if you're looking for the speediest method, you can get into a bit of a production line situation where you take each of the diodes and just bend them in turn to the right 0.45 inch spacing. If you have a mass production mentality about things, you can bend all the diodes, insert them, make sure they're in the proper orientation, check them off as you go, and then with a piece of cardboard, you can flip them all without any of them falling out. And then one by one, bend all the leads to keep the diodes in place, choosing directions that would not cause short circuits. And then finally, you can go around from diode to diode, soldering each of the leads. Which method you use? A lot of people like the method of, I'm doing one diode at a time, I'm checking it off, life is good, it's not a rush. Other people like an approach a little closer to this. It may vary depending on what you are assembling. All the 1N4004s are soldered in place. I haven't cut the leads on the back, but I can do that as a mass assembly operation. All the 1N4004 diodes have been installed, soldered, their leads clipped, and as each one was being put in, we put a check mark so we know that we're done and it gives us a double check. And if your paranoia is extreme, 
You'll just want to turn it over and make sure that all of the white bands on the diodes are in the correct places. I've just added these 0.1 microfarad capacitors. The thing that's interesting to say about them is that these capacitors are not polarized. You can put them in in either direction and everything is just fine. So at this point there's just a few more capacitors to put in. There's three kind of a little bit larger capacitors. So we'll just add those capacitors in the usual way. I'll show you when we're done. There's really no need for you to see me do it. The next capacitors we're installing are called electrolytic capacitors. They are polarized. There is really only one correct orientation to put them in. If you notice looking at the package, one side is marked with a negative side. The other side, the positive side, actually has no marking at all. The other way that you can tell which lead is which, which is positive and which is negative, is that in an uncut capacitor, the positive lead is always longer than the negative. So we're going to pay careful attention to the polarity as we install the 22 microfarad capacitors. And let's do C9 together so we can get one more subtlety about the way this works. Here's where C9 goes into the board. The silk screen shows a positive symbol, and what we're going to do is make the non-negative side of the capacitor, that's the long lead side, go into the positive marked hole on the silk screen. Flip it over, bend the leads a bit to keep it in shape, and we'll solder. All the small electrolytics have been installed. We'll take a little break and we're going to put in the fuse holder. We really do want the fuse holder to be flush to the board. Easiest way to do that might be to take a piece of masking tape, tape it down to the board temporarily, flip it over, and then solder. Now we can pull the masking tape off that the fuse holder is flush with the board. Now we'll insert the fuse into the fuse holder. And then we can pop the fuse in to the board. Now we'll install the large electrolytic capacitors. You'll notice that there are two different voltage ratings make sure you get the correct voltage rating in the correct position. And once again, we are mindful of the polarity so that the minus sign goes away from the positive silk screen marking. Flip it over and solder, and we'll show you when everything is done. 